Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and tonight I'm delighted to be joined by Stuart Slater. Welcome to the show, Stuart. How are you? I'm good, thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me on. It's great to see you, Stuart. I mean, uh, I was saying just before we went on live, I was in the midst of going to the games every week when you signed for us under Liam Brady. Um, so let's go further back. Let's go back to a time where you're playing for West Ham. Liam Brady is one of your teammates. How did West Ham pick you up? Because you made your debut very, very early, didn't you? Very young. Yeah, I did. Um, obviously, I was from outside London, 50, 50 miles outside London, but um, West Ham had a lot of scouts in those days and I played for a nice, good side for on a Sunday side and they were they were keen to, to have a look at me and... Um, one of the games, one particular game, um, the scout even brought Ray Stewart up here, the great Ray Stewart of West Ham mm -hmm. and Scotland. Um, you know, unheard of. So I was playing under fifth, 14, 15, and the scout has brought Ray Stewart up to come and watch me and obviously introduced me to him. And he was playing regular in the first team. It, it is. It's a name that um, up in Scotland we're well aware of. Obviously, he played under Jim McLean at Dundee United before going down to West Ham. And eventually, you would make your debut by coming on for Ray Stewart. Am I right in saying that? That's correct, Paul. You've done your good hard work. Yeah, it was only for about <laughs> seven, eight minutes. But uh, yeah, the hard work of, um, of being down at, at West Ham and, and coming through the ranks, um, being there as a 13-year-old schoolboy apprentice, and then to get my opportunity early doors was... Uh, yeah, much appreciated. And to come on for a, a legend like Ray Stewart, you know, it was a legendary status down at West Ham over 10 years, 400 games, so many goals. It's Scottish International, you know. Um, and for him to, to, I reckon he'd done it deliberately because obviously he had a soft spot for me for, for, me for years and years ago. So he was desperate to get off so that I would come on because the, in those days there was only one sub. You know, when you think back, you were talking about being a, an apprentice back then, Stuart. What was it like, you know, earning your spurs when you were a young boy at uh, Upton Park? I mean, when you compare that to the young players these days, Stuart, what was it like back in your day? Paul, I'll tell you what, it was a massive introduction. It was a massive, uh, you know, leave school, get back into work. Because a lot of the time, yes, there was a lot of football, but there was a lot of work involved. Mm -hmm. Washing kit, rolling kit, cleaning mm -hmm. boots, cleaning stuff, cleaning gyms, um, going down, um, you know, painting the fences at the end of the season. So a lot of the time, half the time was spent doing football, mon um, morning and afternoon. But during lunchtime and after, you know, there was plenty of work. And I had to live in digs um, right close to the, to the ground. But I never got back in before six o'clock. You know, it was just a, a full on, but a great education. You know, hang on a minute. If you don't pull your finger out and make a footballer, you got to go and graft. And uh, that was a great introduction. Oh, definitely. Looking at the squad at that time, you know, some players that Celtic fans will be familiar with, Frank McAvenny, Liam Brady, they're, they're first teamers around about that time. But we'll also be aware of uh, players like Tony Cotty. Um, and it was an impressive West Ham side. You'd done really well at the age of, I think, 18 to break into the side. Um, when you think back to players like Liam Brady, Stuart, what's your memories of him after such a sterling career in England and Italy? Well, I think, you know, that that goes without saying that that's probably one of my biggest accolades in, in football, that Liam Brady playing at the best place, you know, Serie A, I mean, obviously uh, in Italy was one of the best places to play if you weren't playing in, in England and Europe, playing for Juventus. And I think when he retired, I think when he left Juventus, Platini took over his number 10 shirt. I think the 10 shirt was a very famous shirt in, and he just won the title. And obviously he moved on and Platini took his um, jersey. So to have the career that he had, the Arsenal career before, the Irish career, and obviously um, the Italian career and coming back to West Ham, even at West Ham at 32, 33, you could see things that you, go, you could only wish a dream of doing. Um, he just had a wonderful left foot. He was just a magician. He was so intelligent, bright, so, so further forward than anybody else thinking-wise could see things. And for him, you know, at 33, to take a special interest in me when I was a young boy, and he was a, a senior lad um, in 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 at the uh, first team, you know, and that, I think that's where our relationship blossomed. Um, yeah, he 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 saw me, and he, he saw things in me that he thought, "Hang on, me, you know, I'm excited to be part of you." And um, and that's where we go back a long way, Paul. Um, when I was 
breaking in the first team at West Ham, and I had a, a number of games under my belt. Um, I was on £140 a week. Mm-hmm. Liam mm-hmm. knew what was going on, what the other boys were earning, and they were, they were on a couple of grand, two, two, three grand a week. So he's gone, hang on a minute. If you don't mind, I'll go in and ask for you. And it was a player. And the statue of Liam Brady with the – so I said, yeah, that's great if you could. And he said, look, I'm not going to ask you. You don't deserve two grand, three grand. But he said, you, you deserve double because you're playing in the first team. So he did that for me. And um, oh, I was amazed to get double me money, 350 playing in the first team. And then about eight months later, he knew I was flying. And there was big, big clubs after me. Um, Howard Kendall was obviously before Liam. Howard Kendall, Everton were the massive team at the time. Um, he was desperate for me. There was other interest everywhere else, and he just said, "Look, I've got to get you a bit more money." He said, "I'm not going to ask you for the top, but I'm, you know, you deserve football such a short career." So he ended up getting me about 800 quid a week. I think it was at 19 and 20, and um, all off his own back. It weren't from me. He just said, "I've got to get you what you just you you, you deserve." And you know, that was so special for me in, in at that time after the career that he had or during the career that he had. No, absolutely. And of course, Liam Brady makes a, a reintroduction into your career later on. But that's incredible to hear that the senior pro is looking after uh, this up and coming player coming up through the ranks. But you mentioned there that other clubs were interested. And I remember back then, the way that we would keep in touch with English football would be through the pages of Shoot Magazine, Match Magazine. And this uh, Stuart Slater name kept coming up because there was a bit of a, a myth around the keepy uppies. You know, this this check, this guy can do 10,000 keepy uppies. What was the story with that, Stuart? Because w- was your record not something like 10,000? Yeah, I, th- I think I've done 11,000. But as a kid, I was uh, OCD with football. I love me football. Um, come from the council estate. And um, I wasn't interested in school though I wasn't a bad kid at school I just couldn't really learn my attention deficit was pretty poor at the time so um my mum and dad gave me a little bit of grace my dad was a builder so he said look you know obviously things don't happen obviously come work with me and you got graft absolutely graft so I thought I didn't fancy that because I saw how he grafted day in day out um so I, I just took it upon myself at a young age to go right okay I want to be the best I want I want I want not big, so I've got a really, really, I've got a good touch. I want to improve that touch. And, you know, if I went out, if, if I go out in the um, after school and, and play with your mates, but at eight o'clock, I, kn- I knew a lot of boys or people would be doing their homework. I'd still be in the garden, in my own garden. Mum and dad would have to call me back and I'd be keeping the ball up. Or when it got dark early, I'd be in the front room keeping the ball up or in and out the cones. Um, so it just progressed from there. And, um, you know, the more I did, the better my touch became. You know, if it was keeping the ball up or volleying against the wall without it dropping, I just knew it improved my touch massively. So, yeah, eventually somebody said, you keep you up, King, and I did some for charity, and it, that's how it got highlighted a little bit more. Because mm. I always did it. And I still do it now, Paul, to be honest. I was going to ask. Time. Yeah, do you still do that? Yeah, yeah, I still do, uh, you know, obviously to, well, you know, uh, just to keep me, me obviously, a, I can't really run too far, but I can do to keep the uppies and I can I can swim, I can go on the bike, but you know, I've got two dodgy hips. But anything um that's not really too eccentric, then I can get away with. So yeah, I keep keep on that just to just to I don't know, just to keep myself occupied really at the, at this part at this time. Brilliant. I mean, some of the the players, as I said, that you played alongside Celtic fans will have an interest. And although you had lost Frank McAvenny, Tony Cotty, they had a great partnership. Frank McAvenny came back to London after being up in Glasgow, Stuart. Uh, He's a hero at Celtic. He really is. And of course, you married up again with McAvenny later on at Celtic. But you played with him, you know, in his prime down in London. What kind of a player was Frank in his absolute pomp? Yeah, he was just amazing player. I mean, he had that personality. Everyone knows about his personality. Personality that it was just a happy-go-lucky, and he is a happy-go-lucky person. Um, always sort of positive rather than negative. Everyone, you know, and that tracks everybody. Um, so he had a great banter in the change room. So that was half the battle. But you know, boy, could the boy play? I mean, you know, obviously back to goal. You know, so you could use him as a wall if you were a midfield player. It was a dream to play with. You know, you play little one-twos or his little blind side runs. He's, he was intelligent. His movement was great. His touch was good. He was 
brave, he was strong. He, he would score all sort of goals. It was quick. It was pacey. Um, he could be nasty if needed to be. Um, um, he had the all round, all round ability, you know. To well, he was. I mean, I know what he, what Celtic fans, what he did for them um, in the centenary year. And uh, you know, I was fortunate to play with him for a, a few years at West Ham. Then Celtic. Then you know, obviously, you know, again. So um, yeah, um, a great player, great personality, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, proud to play with him. Right. You know, I, I was saying there about your keepy uppies, reading about your progress in the shoot in the match magazines. It wasn't long before, you know, England under 21's captured Stuart. And it looked at that time as though that would be the beginning of a, an international career that would take you to the very top of full international honours. You did break into the B, the B squad as well. I seen on Twitter recently some of your memorabilia and you had your international caps as part of that. I mean, how proud were you? And what's your memories of representing your country? Yeah, I was very proud. Um, I think my, um, me, me dad's got, I mean, my grandparents, well, my nan was from the Orkney, I was Kirkwall. So there was a little bit, hang on a minute, you got that Scottish blood in you, you know, would you go to Scotland? But um, that didn't happen. Um, yeah, very proud. I mean, obviously, like when you represent your country um, and put, put the shirt on and jersey on, very, very proud um, to achieve that level, you know, because there were some good players in the time there uh, when I was playing. And, uh, you know, to reach that level, like you said, um, might go, go on about it a little bit later, but uh, in those 80s, late 80s, early 1991, the four seasons that I had, had with West Ham, um, yeah, I had 200 games on the belt and um, I was just flying. You know, I was fit, I was strong. And um, the interest was massive everywhere. And, uh, you know, um, you know, the last season at West Ham, no no one knew and it happened all the way through my career. Um, I developed Achilles problems. I had high arches, so I used to run on my toes, but that used to cause Achilles and calves problems. And um, I've, got a, I've got an MRI scan every year after, well, the last year at West Ham, Celtic Scotty tried to sort me out with some cortisone injections and then Ipswich when I left. So, you know, that was it really, you know, um, half the season where I was out injured all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've, you've said there about the interest. I, I do remember, even back then, living up in Scotland, sure, I remember the, the famous quarter final against Everton. Uh, it was the FA Cup, wasn't it? And, and the reason I remember it was we used to look at you know the match stats and it would give everybody a mark out of 10. And very rarely did anybody ever get a 10. But Stuart, Stuart Slater got a 10 for West Ham. Um, <laughs> You know, after that game, was that when Howard Kendall, for example, started to show an interest and bigger clubs were trying to prize you away from West Ham? Yeah, it was. Uh, I was so lucky that I had a, you know, you always have a good side uh, that you play really well against, but my side was Everton. Um, prior to that, about a year and a half prior to that, two years, I played up at Goodison when they won the title and I scored a great individual goal. And I think that really set already Howard um, thinking about me at that time. And then to do it a year and a half later, where everything went for me, it was so highlighted um, because um, it was a Monday night. Sky were just getting involved. It was the only game that night, Monday night football, oh, up at Upton Park, 30,000 supporters there. And, you know, it was a big big upset that we beat Everton and we beat them quite convincingly. And, you know, as you said, I everything that I did, and I was involved in a lot of, a lot of the game. I mean, I think the average span of... Um, somebody having the ball is about less than two minutes. I reckon I had the ball for about 10 minutes in that game <laughs> where everything just went, you know, with the goals, with taking players on, um, you know, it just highlighted. And then after that, yeah, it just went berserk and crazy in, in the in the press down here. Mm. And again, you know, when you eventually signed for your old teammate Liam Brady at Celtic, it was seen up here as a massive coup for Celtic. I mean, could you tell me the first... Uh, that you heard of the interest from your former teammate Liam Brady, Stuart? Um, he was quite private. It was so obviously Liam when he when he retired, he wanted to look after me um, full time and go into football agency, and he did that for about a year. And then obviously the silk interest came in for him, him, and so he said to me, "Look, you know, on this, you know, you you can go on to you know with my mate Finn and Jury, you know, one of my partners." 
he'll look after you. He's got a few Irish fellas and all that. So I said, OK, cool. No problem. You know, I, I owe that to you, what you've done for me. So it was his, his um, business partner, Fint and Jury, at the time that gave me the heads up sort of thing. I think West Ham offered me a four year deal um, and he turned it, we turned it down. And I think that was a few months after that. That was the sort of go ahead for Liam to come and get me. Um, I even think Tony Gale at West Ham instigated the whole thing um, uh, by phoning Liam up because I think they were good friends that he said, this is a good time to get Stuart now. He said, I think the club, are, you know, just fed up with, you know, haggling and wanting wanting an answer one way or the other. But I think they're at the end sure. So I think he phoned up and um, gave, gave Liam the heads up. That would have been the right time and it was the right time. It certainly was. I mean, you were the, the record signing for Celtic at 1.5 million. You're swapping London for Glasgow and you signed on the same day. I remember you being paraded with Andy Payton and Rudy Vata, Stuart. Now, at that time, it wasn't a great time for Celtic. You know, we were trying to uh, stop this juggernaut that was Rangers back then. But we did see these signings as a positive. And yeah. when you came up to Celtic, we, as a club, as a fan base, always pride ourselves on being a special club and being a large club. And I know that down south, Stuart, sometimes some English fans just don't rate the Scottish game. What was your first impressions up here? I had a good friend um, that was apprenticed with me in a pro, and I lived with him for the third year, um, John Strain. He was apprenticed with me at West Ham, so he, he moved down three, obviously, when he was 16. We were apprentices together. Um, and then the third year, he came and lived with me. We went back to my parents, and we, we commuted from um, Suffolk to, to West Ham. So as soon as I had the interest of Celtic, because he was a big Celtic fan, I went to see him. He lived in Falkirk. And he he was brilliant, really, um, Paul. He just said to me, look, oh, desperate for you to sign for Celtic. I'm telling you now, I think it's the wrong time. He said the, the fans are not happy with the board. They're worried about where their money's going. They're spending big money on you. He said it's been a bit of a turmoil. That gave me a little bit of a on oh, idea. Do I? Don't I? And it took me two days to sign, to be, to be honest, Paul, um, because I wasn't sure whether Liam was... You know, being honest with me, you know, I know that he wanted me to, to play for him and play for... Well, I'm so glad that I played for a club like that because, yeah, you're right. Down in England, you hear a Celtic Rangers, but you don't realise until you've played and worn that jersey how big it is. It's massive. And to this day, Paul, I always, I'm always i getting goosebumps now. When I do my ambassador work down at West Ham, I said a bucket list for you guys to do is to go to a Celtic game. Mm-hmm. Celtic Rangers or Celtic midweek game. That's a, that's a bucket list for me still to do. You know, I want to spend more time going up and 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 because I played. You know, people say you play for the jersey, albeit you didn't do, you didn't you didn't set the world alight, but you play. And it was a privilege to play for a club. You don't realise, you know, the enormity. The you know, I just got so many fond memories. Though I didn't, you know, win anything at the club, but proud and privileged to play for a club. But you don't hear nothing of it when you're down, how big it is. And mm-hmm. I try and instill it and instill it to all the people that I speak to now, even now, so they're huge, they're massive, both clubs are. You know, it's interesting hearing you uh, talk about Celtic like that, Stuart. When when you came up, we were in the kind of midst of um, sack the board. I mean, that, that was just round the corner, actually, after you left. Uh, but we knew that there were problems. I remember it really well. But there were some moments where we watched the Celtic side that could compete with the very best. So you had a very strong Rangers. And, of course, um, you came and you made your debut against Dundee. But you very soon played against Rangers and, if you don't mind me saying, you had an outstanding game. I mean, at that point, um, I think the big question mark was, what is Stuart Slater's best position? Is he a midfielder? Is he a a winger? Is he a forward player? What what was your opinion uh, on that? What was your best position? As I said, I I, I learned my career playing up front all, all, all the time, from young, from four years of age, five years of age, to up until about 18. Um, you can influence your own performance, I think, Paul. You can go short, you can go in long, you can go wide. Yes, my goals was probably one in two. I was a prolific goal scorer when I was a younger kid. Um, but two years prior to getting going to Celtic, um, Billy Billy put me on the left a little bit. And I had licence to, to come in, but 
I was never taught how to play wide left really properly. And I found it very difficult to get involved. And I ended up creeping in, creeping in and, and losing my shape a little bit more um, for the team. But I just wanted to get involved. I was just one of those that just wanted to get involved because I felt if I've got to keep wide and, you know, you, you don't get the and You get judged on what you do with the ball as a, as a forward player and a skillful player. So I lost that two years. I played wide and I probably played well every sort of three or four games really well. But the other games, I was quiet. Whereas prior to that, when, you know, I was from eight to 18, you know, I could influence my own performance and um, I could go anywhere and, and get involved. So that two years spell when I played wide, when I came to Celtic, you know, everyone was unsure and I probably lost a little bit. Hang on, the goal, where do I see the goal? Where do, you know, I don't, you know, get in the right positions and then, um, you know, do I go short? Do I go long? So for those two years, I probably lost a lot. It should have been natural, but, uh, you know, I became a more deeper player. I didn't get myself in the box as much. And um, because I was a more of a wide player that, in that time. So it was very difficult um, for Liam to to pinpoint because we had some good players, even even that time. Jerry Creaney, Tommy Coyne, Charlie, Frank came back. We had Andy Payton. So we had some good forwards. And we had some good wide players as well. So the competition was immense up there, really. It was at that time. <clears throat> and you're talking about some great players, other names that spring to my mind, Paul McStay and John Collins, as well as Tom Boyd, who came in as well, Stuart. Just how class were they, even though we were going through some hard times? As I said, we, I think it was my first day, um, and I ended up phoning all the people back down in, down south and saying, I think my training gear was number 11, I'm not sure, but I was sitting on my right-hand side was Paul McStay, and my left-hand side was Charlie <laughs> Nicholas. And I'm like in between these, sitting between these for me training gear, and I'm going, you know, obviously I did my research, and oh, obviously I knew of Charlie and, and Paul McStay, my goodness. You know, even down in South, they were legends of the club. Um, as I said, you, you had John Collins on that. You had Tom Boy. They were unbelievable players for the club. Unbelievable players. Once again, privilege. When I look at it and I look at the history of Celtic, and I have done a lot of history over the years, you know, since I always look out for them and, and watch them. But in the hundred odd years that they've been formed, I played with one of the elite legends, you know, that all time Paul McStay, you know, unbelievable that I had the privilege. You know, he will go down, wouldn't he, Paul, up there as one of oh, the yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I played with him. I only had a year there, but I I played 50, 60 games with the absolute legend of somebody that, you know, a club that's been going over 100 years and, you know, to, to, to set foot, uh, you know. And I, I know that he, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure he's, there was a couple of times where he, he appreciated the way I could play. You know, he knew I was a very skillful player. Um, and he said that many a times. And he was, you know, Paul, Paul, what the heck, he was like that. He was such a nice guy. But, you know, he would tell you if you, you know, you do well or you don't do well. Um, but, yeah, to play with him and John Collins and Charlie and and even, you know, Peter Grant, Granty, Grant, he said some <laughs> nice things about me. You know, obviously I didn't. But like he said, you know, apart from Charlie Nix, you're the, the second most skillful player I've ever played with, you know. Um, yes, it hasn't happened for you up there, but I see what why Liam brought you because of the skill that you've got. But I played with Charlie Nicholas and he was elite. But he said, you ain't far off him. So that was an unbelievable comment, you know. And that, that because the time was hard up there at the time um, when I was up there, Paul. Um, but I still appreciate all the support from the su supporters and the club. And But I knew... Um, yeah, it was a tough time. The longer I was there, you, you could see that the club were getting in a little bit more debt. And obviously I left and I know why I left, because obviously uh, I think it, Liam pulled me um, and just said, I've, I've got to pay for Pat McGinley. And he said, I ain't got no, I ain't got no money. The club had got no money. And uh, I think it was just before Fergus McCann came in and you probably know more about it, saved the club really. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Financial mm -hmm. ruin. So I played at a, a club where we tried to to compete with Rangers, spend more money, but initially we were so much in debt at the time anyway. And, you know, it, it was quite a close call. And that's why I left, because obviously they had a bit of a 800,000 on the table, a lot, mm -hmm. yeah, 14 months down, that they had to pay for Pat McGinley. That, I mean, that's interesting. Another thing I was going to ask you, uh, I remember a game, we were on a UEFA Cup 
run back then it was a run if we got two or three games to be fair um, but it was an interesting one because although we were defeated by Cologne away we brought them back to Celtic Park and beat them 3-0 it was a memorable night Stuart you were part of that team um, just think back to that night at Celtic Park what was the atmosphere like? You can't, you can't describe I'm getting goosebumps already you can't describe it I, you know if I could tell anybody I think oh, yeah the the atmosphere, I, you know, it's just you can't put words. It, it just, I'd I'd love to experience it as a as a supporter going up there. And obviously, you know, I played for the club, and I sampled it on the pitch. I'd love to sample it on the uh, terracing, because I don't think anywhere in the world you get that. You wouldn't get that. You know, it gives you goosebumps. It, it you, you know, you don't realise how proud you should be to represent the club, albeit we didn't win anything, but. Um, you know, I keep I keep reiterating that. You know, every time I see somebody about you know about supporters, yes, West Ham. I, I do like in West Ham to because they are passionate. But I, I think I said sometimes you've got to times up by another ten. You know, they they do let you know if you're not working hard, West Ham. So to so they expect the shift, which is rightly so. But if you want noise, then fifty, sixty thousand singing from the box. You know, that's what you get. It's, it's just. I, I don't think you'll experience anything anywhere else. Have you ever been back up yeah. since, since you left for, for Ipswich? No. I, 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 um, I used to come up in the summer. I was um, married to a Scotch woman, but obviously, unfortunately, I got divorced. But uh, So I used to come up in the summer every year for about 12, 30. But I, since I've got divorced, I haven't been back for, up in Scotland for about 10, 11 years. So I used to make, make my way up all the time, go by Parkhead, but it was sort of June, July time. And then... You know, I was still playing at, at times and obviously coaching and bits and pieces like that. So, But I'm really looking forward to maybe, you know, obviously end of lockdown, I'm going to get up for a couple of games. If I can get a couple of tickets now and then here and there once, a, you know, a couple of times a season. Because, you know, you talk about Rudy, I've just, obviously, I thought, oh, I'm going to go out and Twitter, Twitter for the first time. I've never done social media, but what it's opened up for me, Paul, really, you know, I've been in contact with Rudy Vetter from it. Rudy, oh, brilliant. Best best mate um and i've you know i've had a long chat with him um and we had so many good you know i used to room with him we signed together um and when i moved to ipswich he came down and saw me and then we lost touch a little bit and now i'm i've rekindled so i can't wait to come up and see him and you know, relive some some of the memories Brilliant. That's great to hear. And of course, Rudy's uh, friendly with the Albanian president as well, So, <laughs> which we find absolutely hilarious up here because Rudy yeah. has turned him into a Celtic supporter, you know. <laughs> um, part of that European run, and I've got to say this also, I remember Borussia Dortmund away, Stuart, and you were on fire that night. Do you think that might have been your best appearance in the hoops? Certainly for the, the stature, you know, um, UEFA Cup, Borussia Dortmund, I think they went, I don't know, did they win the Champions um, League the following year? I don't know. Or they were, they went up higher, but they had some real top players as well, superstars mm -hmm. in, in their side. And, yeah, we got, I think we got beat 1-0, wasn't it? And I had a couple of opportunities where I've gone through a couple of times and beat a few players. The profile and the highlight of that game, yeah, um, had we got a result, had I scored or assist, then it would have kept it more. But, you know, you did mention the... the um, the Rangers game where I didn't score, we got beat, and I, I, I look back on my time there, and they were strong Rangers, but I think they had Andy Gorham in goal, it was mm. unbelievable, and McCoy would score a goal out of nothing with Haitley just knocking down. We were the pretty team, we were the team that on our day could beat anyone, but sometimes I didn't realise, you know, we were probably too football, football orientated. Um, we had too many skillful players. That's the way Liam wanted. But sometimes you go to to Falkirk and we end up winning five four. But I think we were four three down or four. You know, yeah. some of these yeah. Scots boys they just want to turn you over. And that's what I realised, Paul, that when you go to these clubs, they raise their game massively mm. for Celtic <laughs> Rangers. And I think even more so for Celtic because you know knowing the history of the country of the four fifths of the country you know are probably rangers supporters you know the amount of rangers you know they'd rather rangers win than Celtic win so when you come up against some of these you know they they raise their level massively and then they raise it even more for Celtic. so 
you know, the achievements that Celtic have done in the past has just been amazing because, you know, it's like the back against the walls. You know, everyone would stand a file and want Rangers to win. I remember that game you referred to against Falkirk 5-4. That was incredible. Um, you've mentioned Falkirk a few times and I'm very friendly with Neely Malkin Jr., who obviously whose dad was the kit man back in your time. What's your memories of Neely? Oh, my goodness. Well, I mean, obviously, I, I, soon, I soon got to know him. What he stood, uh, hot shot, hot shot him. I ended up, obviously, staying in Falkirk, um for a long period of my stay at Celtic, I had a good, you know, where my mate John Strain, I stayed with him for a little bit. Oh my goodness, I, I used to pick him up and drop him off. What a man he was, an absolute legend of a man. Um, once again, I, I go all cold now thinking about it. Um, you know, he was brilliant for me. Um, he would tell it how it was to me. You know, he said, he's what you did, you, you know, you you got to do more, you got to do this. But everything that I said, I took everything in. I respected the man and what, yeah, what a player. We, we, we connected so well. So he, I don't think he liked my driving. <laughs> I've been down to London too many times and driven the way London. But, um, yeah, he would he would give me some stick through that. But I spent a lot of time with him. And, you know, I just, I even just now, I looked at his Wikipedia just before I came on here. What, what, what a man, what a player. What to start and to share a car with him for that time to be Jock Steen as well, wasn't it? Was he Jock Steen's good, good friend as well? Was he? It was. I mean, <laughs> Neely Malkin was a, a massive part of that that success, Stuart. You know, back in Lisbon and the nine in a row era, first time round, he was a trainer. So you know, a wealth, an absolute wealth, uh, and a bit of a, a legend to everybody that you speak to who came across him. Yeah, certainly was. And I didn't realise he had that aura. I soon did, but I mean, initially when I first got in, he was asking, you know, you fall, Kurt, you know, yeah, maybe I can get a lift now and then. And, you know, God, yeah, it was my privilege and, uh, you know, privilege because he, he, he taught me and learnt me and the history about the club so much. And, you know, he, he gave me lot, lots and lots of advice and opinion and, you know, just said it will turn and, you know, don't worry, just, you know, be yourself. And it was just amazing for me to settle in. You know, before um, contacting you tonight, we were speaking, the, the Axon boys were speaking about it would have been great if Stuart Slater played in a different Celtic side, you know, in a, in a better t uh, time for the club. Um, I'm sure you would have excelled. It was it was a shame because, you know, we were going through hard times, Stuart, so we might have not seen the best of you um, all the time, but you may not have seen the best of us as a football club, you know, um, some of the successes that we went on to have soon after you left, just a few years after you left it's interesting you've, you've not come back up so hopefully we can organise that at some point Stuart once things get back to normal I would love that yeah I'd absolutely love that to come up and, and, and sample and see and see the ground bring back all those memories and you know I, I just feel gutted that yeah as you said I, I don't think Celtic really saw the best of me because it was the start of the two years I developed these injuries and you know when I left Celtic um, thereafter um, I was into every season for um, six months or four mm -hmm. months, sorry. Mm -hmm. But then I had me operations. I had operations on both Achilles. But that's where, you know, I feel sorry for the. They paid good money for me and they weren't to know, and I wasn't to know, but they paid record signing for me. For the first four or five years at, at West Ham, I was on fire. Didn't really develop any Achilles problems until the last year at, at West Ham. And then no one was to foresee that my Achilles were just going to be the demise of. You know, obviously, my career really, and I had to sort of retire at thirty. I played for another few years, but it was only games only. I could not train. I couldn't play two mm -hmm. games a week, um, and that's a sad story. But you know, as I said, I'm so grateful and ever grateful for the, to put the green and white hoops on because millions and millions of people been before and after would love that opportunity. And I've got some memories, got some great memories, like you said. You know, um, we did beat Rangers once when I was there. Um, you know, we had a good UEFA Cup run and, you know, to, to sample um, the Celtic atmosphere and the Celtic spirit and the Celtic um, fan base, I'll, I'll speak for it forever. You know, that will go ever. And I had a son. I had a son, Murray. Um, I met my ex-wife up in Scotland. So, 
you know, he's the most precious thing in my life. So some good things came out of it. So brilliant. That's, that's excellent. Awesome. It's actually brilliant to hear from you, um, Stuart. And all that's left for me to say is thank you so much for taking the time out to join me on a Celtic State of Mind. You're welcome, Paul. Privilege. Thank you.